All right, so let's go ahead and get started here. Make sure I've got the right microphone so it can hear me all right. Um, I don't have the polyatomic ion quizzes done yet. Um, I'm working on that. And that's part of the reason for not having an additional quiz this last weekend is um, I figured the time that I should that I could spend on um, on rewriting quiz questions to make it more tailored to what we did get through last week, I should probably spend on grading since I'm behind enough and you guys need the feedback. Um, so I just did that. Um, you should start seeing more grades coming through on Canvas uh, in the near future as I get them graded. Remember, anything that shows up with a, with a hyphen or just a dash under your grades, um, even if it says missing, especially if you turned it in on paper, that doesn't mean it's actually missing. It means I haven't put a grade in. If there's an assignment that you are that you are sure you turned in that shows up with a zero, then you have cause for concern and come talk to me and either it's lost in my bag somewhere or it's lost in your bag somewhere. Um, I just keep everything in big piles together. So I don't usually lose things, but it has been known to happen. So um, let me know if that is the case um, and we'll go from there. All right, so we're going to talk about some of the quiz questions from two weeks ago that are still relevant to what we're doing now when it comes to nomenclature and knowing what kind of compounds we have. Um, so how do I know if, if we're looking at a metalloid, how do we know if it's going to make an ionic or a covalent compound? I don't like the term metalloid. It's descriptive in that it, it tells you that it's really, it's kind of metallic, but it's not really metallic, but it's not a great term because it's not well-defined. Um, and different textbooks and different periodic tables will classify different things as metalloid or not metalloid. So with that in mind, so let me go to, uh, we'll just look at P table. So the metalloids are the ones, so it has boron, silicon, germanium, arsenic, antimony, tellurium, and acetine listed as metalloids. Um, some periodic tables have polonium listed as metalloids. Some of them have aluminum listed as metalloid. Um, some even have tin listed as metalloid. So with that in mind, with the lack of consistency, we're not gonna deal with that. We're just going to be looking at those at that stair step line on the periodic table that we've been using for everything. Um, go to, there it is. It's, I know that there's one on the practice exam so we can all see what I'm looking at. So it's sideways right now because I'm in Dropbox. I don't know how to shift this, rotate it in Dropbox. Um, but that stair step line, we're not, we're going to consider everything to the left of that stair step line to be a, a metal, everything to the right of it to be a non-metal and not worry about metalloids whatsoever. And when it comes to naming things and determining whether you have covalent or ionic bonds, same thing. We're only, we're not going to consider the fact that if you have something that's a metalloid like germanium um, with something like tellurium, it's another metalloid. We're not going to consider the fact that that technically makes a covalent bond by some more, more um, descriptive criteria. Um, for now, for this class, we're just looking at that stair step line. That's a hard line. There's nothing to worry about when it comes to that. If you know that, that's all you need to worry about and ignore the fact that metalloids exist. For now, as you get further into science, then we'll start, um, like with everything you're learning now, we're gonna learn that there are exceptions to it and that there are certain times when that's not appropriate we're not going to deal with that at this point, though. Uh, th that was a good question, though. What's the highest number of atoms a covalent bond can go to? So we, we added some more context to this when we started talking about Vesper geometries, right? When we're talking about covalent compounds, um, you can have a whole bunch of prefixes. You can go up to, um, there's certain, you know, go up to like into the 20s as far as using those prefixes. We don't really worry about anything past 10 for the most part, though, because most molecules are going to be governed by what that central atom's geometry is. Um, and so if you have one central atom, 
that we'll just call M for just a random metal, and it's surrounded by other atoms that we'll call X. X is just a placeholder for halogens. So if we have metal surrounded by halogens, if you think about what this shape actually looks like, where you've got a square planar piece here and then one coming up and one coming down, everything's 90 degrees from each other, there's really not a whole lot more room that you could attach anything else, right? So for, the, for your Vesper geometry assignment, we didn't go past four electron domains, right? You can go up to, in Gen Chem, we'll go up to six. And there are some rare cases where you can get up to seven electron domains around the central atom. When, and that one basically looks like a pentagon as a, a flat pentagon around the middle, like the equator. If you think of this as um, M as being the center of the earth and think about the X's as being on the surface of the earth, you can think of these ones right here as being an equator that goes around the middle. And then these ones, are the like the north and south pole. If you can picture putting five, making a pentagon around the equator instead of making a square around the equator, that's the most, it's what's called the coordination number, how many things can be attached to it. The highest coordination number you can have under normal circumstances is seven. And really that's even an exception. Really six is about as many things as you can physically fit around here because then you start forcing these electrons to be way closer than they want to be. And what winds up happening is they wind up rearranging themselves into more into being separate molecules. So for instance, if you had PCl7, phosphorus heptachloride, you could get it to form that structure for an instant for a little bit of time, long enough that you could actually shine some x-rays on it and see where everything is. But very, very quickly, that's going to rearrange itself into phosphorus pentafluoride in the chlorine molecule. Basically, just going to boot off two of the chlorines because it's more stable like this than to force all of the chlorines onto the same atom. Right. So when it comes to the this question with the highest prefix of atoms, well, you can go, prefixes go up really high. And especially if you're talking about organic molecules, we'll start using prefixes to indicate how many carbons are attached in a row. And every carbon is considered its own central atom. Every carbon can be tetrahedral. So you could have something that looks like carbon, 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 you know, indefinitely. The largest carbon, the largest molecules that look like that are, are polymers, like plastics. Most plastics are just long chains of carbons linked together. And those, there's not really an upper limit. We don't really use the prefixes, though, once you get past about 10. There's usually a better way to describe it than just using prefixes. So as long as you have your prefixes memorized up to 10, that's good enough. Right? Anything past that the handle on a case-by-case -case basis, there's probably either a common name for it or you can look up the name and it won't be something you're dealing with on a regular basis. Um, how are the properties of co compounds related to the elements that make up those compounds? The answer is they're not really related at all, um, which seems counterintuitive. So the properties of the compound are made up of the interactions between the, the elements that make it up, but not dependent on the elements themselves. They're not related to the properties of the elements, they're related to the identity of the elements. So for instance, sodium is a solid, has a, um, when it's a metal, it has a very low melting point, um, very soft, very metallic, very conductive. Chlorine as a gas is a gas at room temperature, very toxic, very low boiling point. Its boiling point is right around the boiling point of liquid nitrogen. And you put them together and you get sodium chloride, which doesn't have the same properties as either of them. It's not a good conductor. It's not a gas at room temperature. It can go through a phase change but its melting point is up above a thousand Fahrenheit. So 
the properties of this are a result of the fact that it's made out of sodium and chloride, but they're not related to the properties of the elements that make it up. They're just related to the fact that sodium is a metal and therefore wants to have a positive charge and chlorine is a non-metal and therefore wants a negative charge. So it's really the interaction between these two that gives the compound its, its characteristics, which seems like I'm contradicting myself a little bit. I, I heard it too. Um, the, but it's really that, it's that interaction that makes them behave the way they do once you form a compound. And then last but not least, are compounds capable of phase change? Absolutely. Water goes through a phase change. It's a compound, right? They have all the same phase changes as the individual elemental states do. Every substance that you can have can exist in any phase within reason. You can't, you know, there are different types of solids. You can't make water form the same type of crystal structure as others, but you can, they can definitely make it a solid. When you use it in the broad sense of solid liquid gas, everything that exists can be found in any of those three states, as long as you have the right conditions. Sometimes it just means you have to get really, really cold. The boiling point of hydrogen gas is right around two Kelvin, um, which is really, really cold. You know, two degrees Celsius above absolute zero. And that's its boiling point. In theory, you can make, and actually they've observed this under really, really high pressures. We haven't observed it directly, uh, maybe in a lab. Um, there's headlines a, a year or two ago for metallic hydrogen. Anybody remember reading headlines for that? Seen anything in, in newspaper? It was big news in the scientific community, but if you weren't reading science articles, um, you may have missed it. It was in like, you know, New York Times headlines, but it was science journalism and regular newspapers is questionable at best. Um, yeah, there's, but you can, so you can make hydrogen behave in a metallic way because it is a metalloid. It's right on that, that line, um, but it takes immense pressures to do so. Um, so the, the current thinking is that the center of Jupiter is likely some, is likely metallic hydrogen because it's such high pressures there and, and Jupiter is almost entirely made of hydrogen. Um, but other than that, um, you can't really see solid hydrogen very often. Then again, most solar systems probably have at least one gas giant and the most common element in the universe is hydrogen. So outside of our solar system, it might be true that there are lots of places you can find metallic hydrogen. But within our solar system, it's probably just at the center of Jupiter and in very small amounts in uh, chemistry labs. All right, let's do a little bit of review. I guess I should open it up. Anybody have any other questions, anything um, from last week that you wanted to ask about before we move on? I mean, last week we worked a little bit on balancing reactions. We talked about those Vesper geometries. Um, anything in particular that, that uh, struck you since I didn't give you a chance to ask those questions on the, the optional quiz over the weekend? I mean, I guess I did, but if you didn't take the quiz, then you didn't see that question. Okay. I've changed my strategy. I go until it feels uncomfortably silent, and then I go that same amount of time again. It's still probably too short, but it's better. All right, let's practice balancing these. None of these should be as hard as that one that we ran into last time, but it takes practice.
All right, so if, if the first few were pretty easy for you, then ignore me and keep working on the others while I start talking. I just wanna start walking through the logic. So for the first one, where should we start? Not just what's the answer, but what's the logic? It depends a little bit. So the, the what I find to be the easiest thing to think about is anytime you, you know something has to be true. So there's only one thing that has potassium on the reactant side and it has two potassiums. There's only one thing that has potassium on the, on the product side and it has one potassium. It has to be a two. At the very least, you know, it has to be a two to one ratio, right? No matter what you eventually have to do to the potassium oxalate at the front, you know that your potassium hydroxide is gonna be twice as much, period, right? We know that has to be true because that's the only place we see potassium. So with that in mind, that's a good place to start. Even if we're gonna come back and change the one and the two into a two and a four later on, that's not, a, at the very least, we know potassium is balanced like this. And if we look at that, we know that barium is already balanced because there's one barium on the left and one barium on the right. And oxygen and hydrogen. So here's a little bit of a, of a trick. If you, if you notice that you have polyatomic ions on both sides and they're not changing, like all of my oxygen is still either hydroxide or, or oxalate before and after, right? Then you can really balance it in terms of hydroxides and oxalates since they're not changing what they are. There's not really any need to balance carbons separately. You can just balance oxalates and think of it that way. Um, occasionally that's an oversimplification. You wind up with something not making sense. In that case, throw that assumption out and then you balance all the atoms individually. But in this case, we've got one oxalate on the left. We've got one oxalate on the right. Everybody's taken their polyatomic ion quiz, right? So we all remember that that's oxalate, C2O4 with a negative two charge. So if we got one oxalate on the left, one oxalate on the right, our carbons are balanced. If we have one, if we have two hydroxides on the left, and then when we put that two in front of potassium hydroxide, we have two hydroxides on the right. So our hydroxides are balanced. So we're good now. We have potassiums are balanced. And if we wanted to break it down into the individual elements, instead of doing polyatomic ions, that's fine too. This still will still work. We still have two carbons on the left, two carbons on the right. We have a total of six oxygens on the left and six oxygens on the right. We have a total of two hydrogens on the left and two hydrogens on the right. So sometimes it's as easy as you just put a two in front of one, in front of something. Um, the reason I went through and I added all the red lines is when there's no coefficient drawn, we can assume it's one. But if I give you the space or if you're supposed to fill in a number like on the quiz, then I want you to write that one in explicitly um, rather than just leave it blank. Um, it, you'll still get full credit if you don't, but really what I'm looking for if I put those those empty spots is for you to say that there's a one there. As you get better and better at this, we'll need to do that less and less. It's one of those things that'll make you show your work the first few times and then it won't be as big a deal. How about for the second one? What do we know has to be true about the second one? Well, we have two irons in iron three hydrox or iron three oxide. And we only have one iron on the right, 
right? So we know that there has to be, just like above, we know there has to be a two to one ratio for every one iron three hydro or iron three oxide, we have to make two iron atoms on the product side. Does that take care of everything? What's still wrong? Aluminum, our oxygens are good, right? But we have, we have two aluminums on the right-hand side. So we need two aluminums on, on the reactant side. Incidentally, this is one of the most exothermic, one of the most, um, the hottest reactions known to man. This is thermite. And it even has the name thermite um, from the Latin for heat is therm. Um, because this is this reaction, which is just rust and powdered aluminum. If you mix them together in a two to one ratio, two to one by mole ratio of aluminum to iron, um, iron three oxide. And it takes a lot to get the reaction started. You have to start it by burning magnesium, which then burns hard enough to start the reaction. Um, but it burns hot enough that it'll melt through the engine block of a car. Um, they used to use this to weld um, train tracks together. They would take a big long piece of iron, butt it up against the next piece of, of railroad track, pack the gap in between them full of thermite, light it, and it would burn hot enough that it would fuse the train tracks together. Um, so kind of a fun, fun reaction. It'll melt right through uh, ceramic as well. And ceramics are known for being resistant to heat. All right, how about the next one? What do we do for perchloric acid and NH3 is ammonia? It's making ammonium perchlorate. Just to continually remind everybody how our nomenclature works. Anything tricky about that one? So what do we need? Just the ones, right? And so if I didn't, if I hadn't gone to the trouble of drawing these these gaps here, you just say it's already balanced. You just leave it as is, or just fill in the ones. And how about this last example? That sounds right. This is a familiar reaction. This is propane and reacting with oxygen to make CO2 and water. So this is just burning propane. Um, so we know that we have to have a three to one ratio of propane to CO2, right? So we can fill that in. Even if we have to go back and change it, it's always gonna be in that three to one ratio. And if we do that, we have, we have eight hydrogens on the left. So we're gonna need four waters because every water has two hydrogens. Then it's just a matter of making sure we can get to the right number of oxygens, right? So we get a total of six oxygen atoms from CO2 and four oxygen atoms from water for a total of 10 oxygen atoms. And since we're adding oxygen in the form of O2, we need five O2 molecules. All right, so takes practice, but the more you do this, the more you start seeing the patterns and the more it starts being more intuitive. Um, you'll stop needing to stop and think about it unless it's a particularly tricky one. It'll just be like, oh, boom, 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 one, two, one, et cetera. All right, so we'll just keep working at that. All right, here's where we left off. So I want to get through a couple of these re classifying reactions. Um, 
examples before we do the break. So, and this is, again, this is a result of the fact that I want everybody to hear me say that there are lots and lots and lots of different ways of classifying reactions, depending on what class you're in, depending on what field you're in, depending on what your research is. All of these different reactions have different ways of classifying them, but at its most basic, these are, this is our number one distinction. Either you move electrons or you don't. Right, and so everything is gonna come back to that. That's our broadest categorization is either it's a redox reaction or we're just arrange, rearranging the pieces, but everything that is still there that we had before. And so that's what I call that a complexation reaction. Again, I'm not tied to that name, but I think it's basically just rearranging how things are connected to each other. So for instance, another good, I use the Lego analogy, but for instance, um, magnets on a refrigerator. All you're doing is rearranging where they're attached, right? You're not actually changing what the magnets are when you move them around, right? Your magnet is still the magnet, the fridge is still the fridge, regardless of what order you put them in, or if you put it on the front or the side, right? So that's what a complexation reaction is. You're changing with what the, the type of, connect, not really the type of connections even really, you're changing you know, what order they're connected in, you're changing um, what's attached to what, but you're not changing what you have. It's the same pieces regardless. Redox reactions, you're actually going to change what the comp or what the um, atoms actually look like. All right, so here within complexation reactions, there's a whole bunch of, of different types. These are the most common ones that show up on stuff like a T's test or any standardized test that has chemistry is going to have these two reactions, almost guaranteed. Um, whether or not they call them that is another story that changes from test to test and year to year and textbook to textbook, which is why we're, I'm just going to teach you to recognize them, not necessarily you have to know what the name is. Um, and then among oxidation and reduction reactions, we have metal metal redox, which turns out that's the easiest one to recognize. And then you have combustion reactions, which are also really easy to recognize. But then there are some that, that are redox reactions that don't neatly fit into either of those two categories. So we'll look at how to recognize those as well. So for these complexation reactions, if everything is still the same, if no electrons are changing hands, then the complexation reactions should be the easiest to recognize because everything should be more or less the same before and after. So we're going to go through those first. And this is the key. There's no change in atomic charges. The charge of the entire molecule might change charge. The entire molecule might change charge, but each atom still has the same electrons, same number of electrons and arranged the same way. And so the here is one of the most significant complexation reactions. It's an acid-base reaction. And the easiest way to see those is if it, it involves the transfer of a single H plus ion. So you're not moving electrons, you're moving an H plus. Well, if you're moving an H plus, that means that the charge on the whole molecule can change. But overall, it should be easy to recognize before and after as being pretty much the same atoms. Um, these, the ones I have listed as clues aren't always true, but they're, they're certainly kind of suggestive. So if you have water as a product, if you have an acid, or if you have hydroxide as a reactant, or if you have charges that differ by one, but you can still recognize the same polyatomic ions on both sides. So for instance, um, okay. 
if you have water plus carbonate, and let me go to blank. If you have water plus a carbonate ion, and they react together and you make hydroxide and hydrogen carbonate. The carbon is still carbonate in both of those, right? That's hydrogen carbonate. We just took the carbonate and we stuck an H plus on it. Where did that, car that H plus come from? The water. The oxygen had two hydrogens attached to it. Now it only has one hydrogen attached to it. So the only thing that happened is you took an H plus from water and you gave it to carbonate. Everything is still in the same state, more or less on both sides of this. Nothing really changed. And you can still point to it and say, okay, well, that's still carbonate there. It just got an H plus stuck to it. If I started with this being a balanced react, uh, let's see. Well, I we have some more examples in a, in a few minutes. Um, but so that can be a little bit tricky because wait, what do you mean charges aren't changing? It definitely changed charge. The atomic charges didn't change. What we call the oxidation state, right? So the charge on the whole molecule changed because you moved an H plus but it was carbonate before, it's still carbonate, right? And that's what means makes it a complexation reaction, not a redox reaction. These ones are even easier to recognize. A precipitation reaction is what happens when you mix two aqueous solutions and it makes a solid. So that, process, the solid that you make is called a precipitate. Um, sometimes abbreviated just as PPT for precipitate. Anytime you, you have two solutions of ionic compounds and you mix them together and sometimes they're going to stick together in a way that's not, that's not soluble in water anymore. So that um, like so that uh, lime scale that builds up on the inside of your shower on your shower head, the little crystals, crumbly crystals that form on your shower head, that's a precipitation reaction. That's CO2 from the air reacting with the magnesium and the or the calcium ions that are in your water to make a solid that no longer dissolves in water to make calcium carbonate or magnesium carbonate. But it's really, really obvious once you know what you're looking for, because it's always two aqueous ionic reactants. And it's always going to turn into one aqueous ionic product and one solid ionic product. So basically, you just mix and match the ionic, the ions in a way where you make something that doesn't dissolve in water anymore. Right, because not all ionic compounds dissolve in water. So for instance, so the, um, if we had say sodium carbonate solution plus calcium chloride aqueous, when those react, we form sodium chloride aqueous and calcium carbonate solid. So now we could go through and balance if we wanted. We had two sodiums before and two chlorides before, right? So we're going to need two right there. But if you look at the pieces, everything is the same polyatomic ions or ions. All of your sodium started Na plus and they ended up as Na plus. All of your calcium started as calcium two plus and they ended as calcium two plus. You definitely have carbonate before and after. 
You definitely have chloride before and after. So what's attached to what has changed, but it's still all the same pieces. All right, and so that's why these two reaction types are their own category is because you still have all the same pieces. Everything is the same before and after. You just either made some combination that doesn't dissolve anymore, that doesn't stay dissolved in water, or you moved an H plus from one molecule to another molecule, but they're the same molecules. If we look at the Lewis thought structures for one of these acid base reactions, um, when you have an acidic solution, that means that actually means you have extra hydronium around, which is H3O plus. But I don't need to tell you that because we all remember our polyatomics, right? Hydronium plus, um, let's just say NH3. Ammonia will react to make water. We don't say aqueous water, you can't have water dissolved in itself. So if you make water, then we just say liquid water. That's really splitting hairs, it's not that big of a deal. And ammonium. If we write out the Lewis thought structures, please, before and after. <laughs> Hydronium, the Lewis dot structure. Looks like this. And ammonia, ammonia has a Lewis dot structure that looks like Looks like this. After the reaction, we get water. The Lewis dot structure for water looks like that. And the Lewis dot structure for ammonium Looks like that. All you did in this reaction is you took an H plus from hydronium and you stuck it on that lone pair. Now you still have the same nitrogen, but it's got four H pluses surrounding it instead of only having three H pluses surrounding it. It's still the same oxygen before and after. It just has an extra lone pair because you pulled that H plus extra H plus off. And that electrons that were part of that bond are now a lone pair. And so no electrons are changing hands, despite the fact that it looks like the charges on the whole molecule change. Oxygen is still oxygen, nitrogen is still nitrogen. All right. And so anytime you can look at a reaction and you can recognize, oh, water is just hydronium missing an H plus you almost certainly have an acid-base reaction happening. So carbonate going to hydrogen carbonate, carbonic acid turning into hydrogen carbonate, hydrogen carbonate turning into carbonic acid, nitrate turning into nitric acid, sulfuric acid turning into hydrogen sulfate. Right? Those are all just missing, moving a single H plus around. For these redox reactions, sometimes these redox reactions are, are really easy to recognize because anytime you can look at an atom and you can say, I know that atom's charge changed, that's dead giveaway to redox reaction. And so for instance, if we had sodium metal and zinc ions reacting to make sodium ions and zinc metal, the charge on the sodium went from a zero to a plus one, right? 
And it couldn't have just done that by having an extra H plus moved around because we don't have any H pluses present, right? When we're dealing with single atoms or single atom ions, it's really easy to tell when the charge changes. And as soon as you can look at something at a single atom and say that charge on that atom changed, that's a redox reaction. Full stop. That's the whole definition of a redox reaction is that you moved electrons from one atom's valence to a different atom's valence. Sometimes it's not as easy to tell whether it's a redox reaction. For instance, in combustion reactions, a combustion reaction has a very specific definition. A combustion reaction in particular means you have something with carbons and hydrogens reacting with oxygen and it will always make CO2 and water, always. That's, that is what a combustion reaction is, is something with hydrogens and carbons reacting with oxygen, making CO2 and water. So this has the strictest definition of any of these reactions. This is not a broad definition at all. The second you see something reacts with oxygen, makes CO2 and water, boom, combustion, done, move on, right? So there are other reactions that make water. There are other reactions that make CO2, but specifically having all of these elements, hydrocarbon reacts with oxygen and makes CO2 and water. So what makes this, if we don't have any charges, how do we know that this is a redox reaction other than the fact I just told you it was? Instead of just taking me at my word, if you were going to question my logic on this, how do we know if anything's changing charge? It's all covalent bonds, right? So nothing's really even has a charge, right? Everything's sharing electrons. With covalent compounds, if we wanna know if it's a redox reaction, the way we can tell is we basically say, okay, we're gonna treat it like it's an ionic compound and whatever's most electronegative gets first dibs on the electrons. So basically whatever is closest to fluorine takes all the electrons at once first. And whatever else is in that molecule has to make do with what's left over. Right, so if we look at CO2, we only have two atoms there, right? We have car well, we have three atoms. We only have three, two elements. Which is more electronegative? Which one's closer to fluorine? The oxygen is, right? And we've already used oxygen a couple times as like, oh, it's it's one of our biggest bullies when it comes to the sharing electrons, right? Well, in this case, each oxygen needs to gain how many electrons to be stable? It has six valence electrons on the periodic table. So it needs to gain two. So we can say, okay, well, just like we would for an ionic compound, we're gonna look at this and say, okay, well, if oxygen is gonna be negative two and there's two of them, what does the charge have to be on carbon to make it add up to zero? Plus four, right? So that's what's called oxidation states and it's Defining oxidation states is basically working backwards from the formula to get to a charge. Treat it like it's an ionic compound, even if it's a covalent compound. This doesn't mean the carbon actually has a plus four charge, but when you stick it with two oxygens, it behaves like a plus four charge in a lot of ways. Let's do water real quick. What does the charge want to be on the oxygen to make it stable? Same, right? Still wants to be negative two. 
So what does the charge have to be on each hydrogen to make it add up to zero? Positive, there's two of them, so they each need to be plus one. What is the charge on the oxygen here? In an O2 molecule, we only have one atom, right? So the oxygens both have to be the same because they're identical and it has to add up to what charge? Zero, right? So if we have two oxygens that both have to be the same charge and they have to add up to zero, what's the charge on each oxygen? Zero. Algebraically, what I just asked is two times X equals zero, right? X has to be zero. So our oxygen went from a charge of zero to a charge of negative two, regardless of which of these oxygens we're looking at. It changed oxidation states. Even though these are not ionic compounds on either side, the oxygen went from a zero oxidation state to a negative two oxidation state. That's what makes it a redox reaction. Even though we can't look at it and say there's a charge there. When we treat it like it's ionic, when we force it to say, well, push comes to shove, who really has control of those electrons? The oxygen does. And that allows us to say, okay, well, that's gonna change the oxidation state. How about for CH4? What's more electronegative? What's closer to fluorine between carbon and hydrogen? Carbon. So how many electrons does carbon need to gain in order to have a full valence? Has to be four, right? So that means that the carbon has to have a negative four. What does the charge have to be on each hydrogen? There's four of them and they're each plus one. So the hydrogen didn't change. The hydrogen went from plus one and the hydrogen over here is still plus one. The oxygen went from zero to negative two. The carbon went from minus four to plus four. If we track these, if we balance this reaction, we track this whole thing the whole, all the way through, all of the charges have to add up to zero still because that's the charge on both sides of our original equation zero. We can actually track the individual electrons and say, okay, well, each carbon had to lose four electrons actually to go from negative four to a plus four, um, more than four electrons really, right? Eight electrons. Because here, carbon gets to be the bully. Carbon is more electronegative than hydrogen, so carbon gets control of the electrons. But then when you put it with oxygen, oxygen gets to be the bully. Carbon gets the one gets is the one getting picked on. All right. So even though nothing has a charge, we can look at it and say, well, that carbon really effectively lost electrons, despite the fact it's not an ion on either side. All right. And so that's going to be our foolproof way. You can always recognize a redox reaction. As soon as you can look at it and say, well, I know something changed oxidation states. Boom, redox reaction. Always, that's always a go-to. If you're not sure if it's a redox reaction or not, start looking to see if anything changed charges. And again, the most obvious ones are you don't even need to do that for combustion reactions. As soon as you can look at a combustion reaction and say, oh, well, it's something with carbons and hydrogens reacting with oxygen to make CO2 and water. And really most specifically, it's really carbon reacting with oxygen to make CO2 and water because
that's a particularly important reaction. Anybody know what that reaction is? Well, we're making carbon dioxide from what though? What's solid carbon? I guess what's carbon is, what is it? Not gas. It's not a metal, it's a metalloid. Coal. It's anthracite, which is coal, and most it's most common form. If you put it in the right conditions, you make a diamond out of it. The diamonds will still burn, actually. This is a combustion reaction. This is what happens in coal burning power plants. You take pure carbon, burn it with oxygen, and you make CO2. So not even you don't need the hydrogens necessarily for it to be a combustion reaction. You need carbon plus oxygen makes CO2. And then if there's hydrogens around, you'll also make water. All right. Let's, let's take a break. Let's come back at five after. And we'll work on some more practice with this. So it doesn't need to be double bonds, no, right. because it still counts as one electron domain either way, right? So it doesn't really matter. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, in the poll, it says that you can take one or more, and then there's a one or two break. Is there a third series of that? A third quarter, yeah, in yeah. the spring. So it'll be a one or three. Yeah. Is that the same for the organic chemistry? Um, like a 221? Yes, but the, is registration about to open up? Is that um, yeah, just we'll so? We'll, let's talk. I'm going to talk the whole class after, when we come back, but. Um, depending on what you're doing, you probably don't want to take OCHEM 1. Um, if you're allied health, like meaning your nursing, x-ray tech. So at TMCC, I need a 220 introduction to organic chemistry is what it says. So is that not the same? So no, our introduction, so we want to double check. We're starting and we're trying a new class next year. Not trying, we're, we're teaching a new class next year. This intro to organic and biochem, it'll be in the spring. Um, that that's, if you only need one more quarter of chemistry, that's what you're going to want to take. Okay. So you might have something that will equal to that? Yes. Okay. It, it, sh it should transfer. Okay. We might just have to, not transfer it's a new class. So we, we, I'm we so confused. it's, that's normal. Um, so this, our new class, which is chem 118 will be next spring. And that's, that's what you need. Um, but because it's new, it might not be on the books yet at TMCC. So we just need to get them 
But if you don't, if you don't need, if you only need one more chemistry class, you need 118. Um, but if, I can't do 118 without doing 101 and 102. No, yeah, you can. Okay. This this class is the only prereq for it. Okay, so I might I can, I can probably just go to the. Probably yes. Okay. So we'll in so we'll we'll have a counselor get on the phone with TMCC. Okay. Um, to to double check this, okay. but that should be all you need. If they say no, that doesn't meet our requirements, then then you can take OCHEM one in the fall without taking Chem one hundred one or one hundred two. If you need a whole year of chemistry, though, you're, what's what field are you trying to go into? IG. So that would be that's overkill to take the whole Gen Chem series okay. and then take upper division OCHEM because our OCHEM two hundred twenty okay. is upper division OCHEM, um, which ours, is like ours is. Okay, I didn't see a two hundred twenty here at all. 220, 221, yeah, it's, that's quarter one of a three quarter series in OCHEM. That's pre-meds, chemistry majors okay. um, for hygiene, nursing, dental, or um, x-ray tech, that stuff. You only need 118, you should transfer at their 220. Okay, that's awesome. So, and if anything change, you can always register for 101. And then as over the summer, all of this should get more solidified. Okay. I just um, put it in there for now and I'll change it. Yeah, like, but you you probably do but not that need that whole be thing. Available till next spring. Anyways. Correct. So, okay. So there's no rush. Okay, cool. Okay. One more question. Yes. Yeah. I don't know if I'm doing this right. This wouldn't have had a name for it. No. And you could call it you could call it linear, but or so if it's linear, you could call it 180, but it doesn't really have a bond angle because yeah. there's only two things. Okay. Cool. You can't have an angle between two objects. Make sure I'm doing that right. Yeah. And then here on number 16, you just wanted us to like what, attach a paper and yeah. write that out. Yep. And just practice. Same with 17. Yep. Okay. More practice, cool. right? Just put it here. Yeah, if you're done with it, I'll take cool. it. Thanks. That's the idea. That's why we're trying to offer that. Okay. Yep. Thank you.
All right. So a couple, a note about a few things before we we come back in. It's almost time to start registering for classes for next year, right? And this is the first chemistry class that any of, well, maybe not any of you, first any uh, chemistry class any of you have taken here, at least. Um, so just to orient you with respect to the chemistry classes that we have here, if you only need one more chemistry class, if you're going into nursing or dental hygiene or anything what they call allied health, so x-ray tech, things like that, you probably only need one more chemistry class. If you're taking one more chemistry class, that class is gonna be 118. That's our intro to organic and, and intro to biochem that's gonna be offered next spring, right? So it's designed to meet the same requirements for, for nursing programs, et cetera. There are a few nursing programs out there that require a whole year of chemistry. UNR is one. UNR doesn't accept very many of our students anymore because there's some, I don't know if animosity is the right word, but if you're not, if you didn't earn your transfer units in Nevada, if you're not a Nevada resident, then they, they take points away from you basically in the application process. They give preference to people that are Nevada residents. Um, and nursing programs, especially nursing at UNR, is so competitive that the couple of extra points that you get for being a Nevada resident is usually enough to make or break. We have very few nursing students transfer to UNR. Um, it's a result of losing the good neighbor policy a few years ago, and that's all been legislated down at Sacramento and in Carson City and them squabbling with each other about trying to make sure their state's students get what they need. Um, and as a result, us here on the state line, we wind up losing out because now there's a difference between Nevada and California. Um, so if you're trying to go to UNR, you might need a whole year of chemistry, in which case you might have to take 118 and then the first quarter of real okay. That's an exception to the rule. For the most part, if you need two chemistry courses, um, all you need is 100 and 118. If you're an engineering major or a science major, if you're an engineering major, you have to take two quarters of Gen Chem. So you're going to come in here and you're going to take Chem 101 in the fall and 102 either this spring or sorry next winter or the winter after, depending on how your physics fall and what your educational master plan and all that looks like. That's a scheduling thing. If you're an engineering major, you have to take 101, 102 as well. If you're a science major, you need to take the whole Gen Chem series, 101 through 103. And if you're a chemistry major, pre-med, or a biology major, you need to take probably the whole year of OCHEM as well. Um, the good news is that gets pretty much all of your lower division units out of the way before you transfer, if you do that. And it's a lot cheaper to take OCHEM here than it is to take at UC Davis. Uh, and at UC Davis, you'll be in a class of 500 people, um, literally. So you're in, in the Mondavi Center for your lectures. Um, so I highly recommend if you are a science major and you need to take a full year of OCHEM, or at least the first two quarters of um, Real, real OCHEM. Um, I highly recommend doing it here, even if it means waiting another year to transfer, just because you tend to have better outcomes, better passing rate, um, and that's all definitely a lot cheaper. All right. So just just to give everybody an idea of where you need to go from here, um, if you're not sure when you're registering, I would register for Chem 101 If you're just, if you might change your major. Um, if you're thinking, hey, I thought I was going to be nursing, but I kind of like taking these science classes. Chem, Gen Chem it transfers really well everywhere. If you take the full year of Gen Chem, then that's 
will be, and then decide to stay nursing, that's pretty much, that's overkill, that'll transfer and you'll be done with chemistry. Um, and I think Gen Chem is a really fun series personally, you start getting into things like rates and equilibrium, and, um, but that's my personal preference. Um, and so I, that's, that's really what I want, want to make clear. This is a new course. 118 is next year, next spring will be the first time we're ever teaching it here, but it's made to be analogous to a whole bunch of other courses in the state of California um, and pretty much any California based nursing school or allied health program, you would need at most 100 in 118, if not just 100. Right? So depending on where you're trying to transfer, you might be done after this class of chemistry. If you're trying to go to certain programs, double check those programs requirements. Um, and maybe meet with a counselor or get somebody from that department on the phone and say, hey, we have this intro to, to organic and biochem, is that gonna meet your requirements? And, you know, they'll, or if you email them, and probably what'll happen if you do that, just to, to set you guys up for success there, um, is they'll say, well, we don't know, we need to look at the syllabus or the course outline of record, which case you just have, you know, if you set up an email chain to that person and with the counselor, they'll contact me, or just loop me in from the beginning. I'll send them the course outline of record. You can get, wipe your hands of it at that point, and they'll either they'll make the decision yes or no um, as whether or not that class meets their requirements. And then you can go from there if you need an extra chemistry class because they want a whole three quarters of chemistry. Um, then we can talk about what makes the most sense for your major and you personally, whether it's taking 101 and then 118, or if it's taking 118 and then 221, those are all possibilities depending on what program you're trying to get into um, and what they, what they want, right? So just, if you have questions about it, be in contact with me if you're standard science or, or engineering um, majors. And really, and this is unfair, but allied health is where it gets a little wibbly wobbly. Um, because some schools want some classes or don't recognize that that meets one criteria, but they use it for another criteria. Ones in blue and green, these are very standard courses transfer everywhere. Um, so if you're an engineering or science major, this is your route. And you might just need these two if you're engineering. Although organic chemistry is so cool, how could you not want to take organic chemistry? It's very different than this than the chemistry that you'll have in this class and in in um, Gen Chem because it's not numbers based. It's all qualitative in learning how these charges and these structures and lone pairs and things like that interact with each other to make more stable structures. And so it's a lot of talking about well, if we want to make this molecule over here because it's a pharmaceutical. How do we start from benzene and make, you know, Tylenol? Um, we get to do a lot of fun problem solving like that. And it's less about calculate this, do some conversions here. What's your theoretical yield there? Um, so if you struggle through Gen Chem, you might actually really like OCHEM. People generally, generally people that really like OCHEM didn't like Gen Chem and generally people that really like Gen Chem struggle with OCHEM because they're very different classes. And occasionally you like both of them, um, even if you struggle. All right, let's talk about, I if I could find a better table here. Uh, I don't really like that table. These oxidation states, it's really all about that electronegativity, like we were practicing. All right, so in order to determine whether something is oxidized or reduced, let's define those a little bit first. Um, oxidized, I'm just gonna temporarily cross this out because I don't wanna confuse you at the same time. This is the, the memnonic device that I find most helpful re for remembering things. Um, when it comes to oxidation versus reduction, oil rig 
tends to go, go over pretty well. Oil rig stands for oxidation is, is loss and rig stands for reduction is gained, is gaining, is gain. Sounds like, sounds like a 4chan meme or something. Reduction is gain. Um, what this is referring to is the electrons. If you lose electrons, that's an oxidation reaction. If you gain electrons, that's a reduction because it's in reference to the charge. You gain electrons, your charge is reduced, right? Because of John Benjamin Franklin. Are you getting the charges wrong? If you gain an electron, your charge is reduced. The other one that is just dumb enough that people that it might help people is Leo the lion says Gur. Lose electrons is oxidation, gaining electrons is reduction. Either way works. If you just think about reduction is referring to a charge, you can just get to it that way every time. The other way that works is um, what do metals do when you expose them to water and air over time? They oxidize, right? They rust. And what's happening to their charge when that happens? It's going from zero when it's a metal. And what do metal, what kind of ions do metals make? Plus, right? So if you know that metals go from a zero to a plus charge and that's oxidation, if you remember oxidation means rusting, then you can get to it that way too. So reduction must be the other way. Right? So there are a lot of ways you can kind of arrange this in your head and hopefully I didn't just give you too many options and make it confusing. Um, they all agree with each other though. So whichever of those make the most sense to you or is these easiest to remember, go with that. Um, I'm always, always been partial to Leo the lion says Gur myself, but that's just because I learned it first. All right, so take your choice for any of those. So if we go back to our example here, I'm just going to put the same charges that we already had back on. Oxidation or oxygen went from zero to a minus two. And carbon went from a minus four to a plus four. So what's oxidized and what's reduced? What gained electrons? Oxygen gained electrons. So that's our reduction. Carbon went from minus four to a plus four. So it lost electrons. So that's our oxidation. These always have to happen. They both have to happen. You can't have an oxidation without also having a reduction, right? Because the electrons have to go somewhere. If oxidation means you lost electrons, where did the electrons go? They had to go to something else, right? So when you have metals being oxidized, if you leave iron out and it oxidizes, what's being reduced? What's that, what are you actually making? when you do that. It only happens if you leave it out in oxygen. If you have iron metal and oxygen gas, they react together to make iron oxide. The metal is being oxidized, so it's being reduced. The oxygen, right? 
right? So these things always are going to happen in tandem. You have to have, if there's oxidation, there's also reduction. It might not, just be, it might not be obvious at first where that reduction is necessarily, but you will always have both of those happening at the same time. So how about the easier one up above? What's oxidized and what's reduced? And why would you say that? So it's starting with the plus two and it's so remember oxidation reduction, we're talking about a change, right? So you can't just look at where it's starting. Zinc starting as a plus two and going to what? Zero, it's a neutral. So did it have to gain electrons to do that or lose electrons? It has to gain electrons because the charge dropped. The charge was reduced. So the zinc ion is being reduced. The sodium metal starts at zero and goes to plus one. So the sodium is being oxidized, the zinc is being reduced. So here's another fun one. Um, the, uh, that like blackish looking um, substance that kind of starts appearing on the outside of silver. If you've ever looked at, if you're, um, grandparents or parents or something have like an old set of, of family silver. It has like little crusty looking black stuff on it a lot of times, right? Yeah, so either that's either a mixture of um, silver oxide or silver sulfide. Um, we'll just call it oxide for the easier. So you use silver polish, which is just a paste made up of solid zinc. And, and what happens is the zinc gets oxidized to make zinc oxide, which is easy to wipe off. And silver metal. So, and if we were balancing that, we would do that. So what you're actually doing when you polish silver, it's not scrubbing the oxide off. If you use silver polish, it's actually turning the silver oxide back into being silver metal. So you're actually redepositing the same silver atoms back onto the, the surface and wiping off the zinc oxide. Um, so in its plus one state, silver starts with a plus one and it goes to zero. Zinc starts at zero and ends up as plus two. So what's being oxidized? The zinc is being oxidized, which means what's being reduced? The silver. Is the oxygen being reduced or oxidized? No, the oxygen is the most electronegative thing there, right? And it always has something weaker than itself it can pick on. So the oxygen starts as minus two and it ends at minus two. So the oxygen is not changing oxidation state. It's what we call a spectator because it's, it's there. It's part of the product and part of the reactants but it's not changing oxidation state. So it's not really that relevant. All right, so this is a page that's just a bunch of practice for uh, assigning oxidation states and again, I'm not particularly fond of this chart anymore because it really just comes down to electronegativity. Um, and there's one in particular I want to talk about just to make a point. If we looked at 
hydrogen peroxide. That's this molecule here, H2O2. Is peroxide on your list of polyatomics or not? Not till gen chem, I guess. Peroxide is O2 with a negative two charge. Um, in this case, what is the oxidation state going to be on the oxygen? What does it want to be? Well, so it could be neutral if it was just O2. The oxygen would be neutral. The, the overall molecule is going to be neutral. What is, how many electrons does oxygen want to get to become most stable though, to fill its valence? It starts with six. There's a lot of different numbers. None of them were what I was thinking. It's wants to, it starts with six, it needs to get to eight. So it needs to gain two electrons, right? Can it be negative two in this case? How many electrons does each hydrogen have to have? I guess let's, if we, if we did this, what is the oxidation state on the hydrogen then? We needed to add up to zero, right? So that would say that we have two hydrogens that each have to be plus two. Can that be? How many protons does hydrogen have? Just one, right? And it's when it's neutral, it's one proton, one electron. It doesn't have two electrons to give. And even if it did, it still only has one proton. It can't be plus two ever, full stop. So that means that something has to be different here. What's the most positive charge that you could have on on hydrogen would be plus one. What's going on here? I don't know what's going on. Go to this method maybe. So if hydrogen can only be plus one and there's two of them, even though oxygen tries to be negative two, what does it have to be in this case? It can only be a negative one. So there are, there are some exception cases for when hydrogen's involved because hydrogen has a limit to how many electrons it has. So hydrogen can only ever be plus one, zero, or negative one. Then that's one of the things that makes hydrogen peroxide so reactive, dangerous, is that that's a really unstable oxygen. Hydrogen peroxide, when you expose it to UV light or heat, it turns into oxygen radicals, free radicals that react really, really easily with everything because it's really unstable with that negative one state. But if all you have is hydrogen around, it has to stay there until it can find something else it can steal electrons from. All right, let's get out of this now and see if I can make this work like normal. All right. So other than that, other than that particular case where hydrogen is, is limiting how many electrons oxygen can have, oxygen will pretty much always either be zero if it's just oxygen gas, O2, or it's gonna be a negative two. There's about the only possibilities for oxygen because it's so strong. All right, so there's one other term I wanna talk about. So let's look at this reaction. So this is sodium metal reacting with water to make sodium hydroxide and hydrogen gas. Let's assign oxidation states for everything and see what's being oxidized and what's being reduced. And just a hint, if you already, if you remember what we assigned for oxidation states for water, 
it's the same. Water is always going to be the same oxidation states for everything involved, right? Every water molecule is the same. I just filled in for the water what we did before. Oxygen is the most electronegative. So it wants to be a negative two and there's two hydrogens. So that means the oxygen can be negative two and each hydrogen is plus one. A note about ionic compounds when there's polyatomic ions. If there's ionic compounds, if you can split it into what the charge is on each ion, then that means you don't need to go through the whole thing. If we can say the sodium hydroxide is sodium ions and then hydroxide, you can, you can uh, assign oxidation states individually for those. That simplifies things, right? Because what's the oxidation state on sodium with a plus one? What's the chart? Oxidation state, remember, is our specific term for talking about charges, right? So, What's the charge on sodium with a plus one? Plus one. Wasn't trying to be a trick question. It really is that simple. So what's the oxidation state for the oxygen in hydroxide? The whole thing is a minus one. Oxygen would like to be minus two, right? And if oxygen's a minus two, what does the hydrogen have to be to make it add up to a total of negative one? Plus one. So I'm throwing this at you on the fly. We wanted them to add up to zero when our whole compound was neutral. If our compound has a charge, we want all the oxidation states to add up to that charge instead of adding up to zero, which makes sense, right? Because oxidation states are really just our way of keeping track of where the electrons are relative to the protons. So if you have ox hydroxide with a negative one charge, you need your oxidation states to add up to negative one. Since I used that space below, we'll move the arrow. Come back. This computer is struggling today. It's not just me, I promise. That hydrogen, hydrogen gas, H2, neutral charge. What's the charge have to be on each hydrogen? Normally, if it was paired up with something more electronegative than itself, hydrogen is gonna be a plus one. But in this case, it's paired up with itself, right? So they both have to be the same and they both have to add up to zero. So it has to be zero. Anything in its neutral elemental state is always going to be zero, which also takes care of the sodium when it's neutral as a charge of zero, as an oxidation state of zero. All right, so there's a lot of stuff on here now. What atom is changing oxidation state?
for the uh, sodium. Thank you. The sodium goes from a zero to a plus one, and all of our hydrogens start at plus one. Some of them stay as plus one, but some of them go to zero. So in this case, the sodium is going from zero to plus one. So does that make it oxidation or reduction? Oxidation. The hydrogen is going from plus one to zero. So it's charge dropped, therefore it's reduced. You know, it would be really handy for PowerPoint to implement is be erase all red ink instead of all ink. I'm going to, I'm going to write Bill Gates in an email, strongly worded letter. Well, what temperature does hydrogen peroxide be? Uh, you never really see it in its pure state. So I don't actually know. Um, the hydrogen peroxide solution you buy from the grocery store is 97% water. So it's still going to be pretty close to the freezing point of water. Um, if you get stuff from a hydroponics store, you can get um, hydrogen peroxide solution that's either 9% or I think I've seen it as high as 20%, um, but that's really flammable. Um, and that's going to have a significantly different, uh, maybe not, the high, freezing point of hydrogen peroxide, pure hydrogen peroxide is still probably going to be pretty close to that of, of water, maybe a little bit higher. But that's speculation. Anyway. It's neither here nor there is what it is. Um, if we have two compounds listed, one being reduced, one being oxidized, there's another term that gets used that it's not entirely obvious why we would care about this term yet. It's one of those things that I'm gonna try to give you good habits so that when you take OCHEM, it makes more sense and you know all the, the right terms. Oxidizing agent and reducing agent. Agent means one who acts, right? And it's most basic. An agent is something, someone who does something or an object that causes something to happen. So an oxidizing agent means whatever you put it with gets oxidized. So it's basically, it's playing around with what in the English language they call the passive voice, which you're changing your frame of reference. Whatever is being reduced is oxidizing whatever you put it with, right? So it seems backwards, but it's, it's tricky to keep them straight. Whatever is being reduced is an oxidizing agent. And whatever is being oxidized is a reducing agent. Right, so in this case, we talk a lot about sodium. Sodium metal is really, really good at being oxidized. It's really easy to oxidize sodium metal, which means it's a really good reducing agent because whatever you put with sodium metal, sodium is going to force it to take an electron because sodium is trying to get rid of that electron as fast as it can. So whatever you put with sodium will be reduced which makes sodium the reducing agent. All right, so again, it's just flipping that frame of reference. If you're thinking about from the perspective of that atom, it's being oxidized. If you say, oh, when I put this atom with something else, what does it do to whatever I put it with? Now you're thinking in terms of if it's good at being oxidized, it's a good reducing agent. And it's been a long time since I had an English class, but I believe you're changing the subject of the sentence in that case. You're shifting the frame of reference in physics terms from whatever the compound is to whatever you put it with. And so 
if you can assign, if you can draw these arrows to show, okay, here's my reduction reaction, here's my oxidation reaction, then assigning oxidizing agent and reducing agent is really straightforward. You just have to remember that it flips. And now that I've spent 10 minutes talking about the English language and the meaning of the word agent, you'll at least remember that there's something weird with it, right? Maybe it'll take more practice before you actually get it to stick, but at the very least, you know to be paying attention to it. It's not as simple as, as it might seem on the, on the surface. All right, let's want to, let's go through this practice and then we'll call it, and that'll give us a nice, well, we're about one full lecture behind where I normally am right now, um, but we'll be able to make it up. I know you're worried about that, right? You wanna make sure I get all that material on the final, um, but we will catch back up at some point. It just won't be today. So let's do this problem. Start by balancing, figure out what's being oxidized and what's being reduced. And then figure out how many moles are in five pounds of propane. It's been a long time since we did a um, conversion problem, right? So refresh your memory on how to do this. If you're thinking to yourself, it feels like we already balanced this reaction once today. It's because we did, but it's still good practice either way, right? Go through the process. The only thing that ever gets tricky with combustion reactions is sometimes you wind up with an odd number of oxygens in your products, in which case you just double everything. Defining the oxidation state of carbon and propane is a little tricky because there's two different types of carbons in propane and they are going to have slightly different oxidation states. Um, if you just treat it like this, you wind up with a non-integer number. 
for carbon, but either way, it's gonna be negative, right? It's negative eight over three, which seems like, well, how can we have, how can we have uh, a partial oxidation state if we only deal with, with whole numbers of electrons? It's because this molecule really looks like this. And the carbons on the outside have more hydrogens around them than the carbon that's in the middle. So they have, they have a different oxidation state than the carbon that's in the middle. More carbon hydrogen bonds means a more negative oxidation state. So these ones would be negative three. And this one would be a negative two. So but that's beside the point for this course. I'm just explaining why you can have a partial number at this point. All that really matters is it's negative something, negative eight over three going to plus four. And oxygen starting at zero and going to negative two. So if the carbon's starting with a negative charge and going to a positive charge, is it being oxidized or reduced? Oxidized. Oxygen is going from a zero to a negative two, so it gained electrons. So that's our reduction. So in other words, oxygen is the oxidizing agent. Carbon is the reducing agent. The, the propane is the reducing agent, which, and now all of a sudden it makes more sense. Oxygen is the oxidizing agent and we call it oxidizing because basically most common oxidation reactions that happen in nature on earth add oxygen to stuff. That's where that name literally comes from. It's an oxidizing agent because you added oxygen to something, which might help you remember it as well. If we wanna know how many moles are in five pounds of propane, and propane is C3H8, how do we figure that out? What's our roadmap, just generally speaking? We want to know the molecular weight of the propane. And then we can go from grams of propane to moles of propane. And we know that on our conversion sheet, we have an easy way to go from mass to mass, right? We have a conversion for, for pounds to grams, right? Even if you don't have it memorized. We're going to use our molecular weight to do that conversion. So I'm gonna clear this just so we have fresh space to work with. Let's say it's 5.0 pounds. Well, if we wanna to convert to grams, first we have to use our pounds to grams conversion. So one pound is 453. It's really the, the little zoom toolbar that keeps messing this up. 453.59. And we want the molecular weight of the propane. We just add up all the pieces. So propane was C3H8. So three times carbon's mass, which is 12.011. and eight times hydrogen, which is 1.008. 36.44.1-ish, 0 0.11 maybe.
see some perplexed faces, but nobody's correcting me. So I'm assuming I'm good enough within sig figs. Okay. Then if we're gonna use that as a conversion, we just need to cancel out grams and be left in moles. What do we get for an answer? That sounds about right. All right, I know I'm over, but I wanna make this last point. If I have that many moles of propane, how many moles of CO2 am I gonna make when this reaction happens? How many molecules of CO2 get made every time one molecule of propane reacts? Three, right? That was the whole purpose of balancing is that we can say that the end has all the same pieces as the beginning, right? So if I wanna know how many moles of CO2 I'm gonna make, it's just one more conversion. Cause I can say one mole of propane makes three moles CO2. Because it's balanced, I can say that the top of that conversion equals the bottom half. This is why we spent so much time on conversions because this is really important in chemistry and we'll spend a whole lecture on it on Wednesday. <laughs>